First, the trade war. And now, the pandemic. In the continuing clash over geopolitical dominance, two of the world's biggest economies are sparring yet again. We're not happy about China, I will tell you that. Two, three months ago, President Trump was saying that the virus was not serious, that hasn't been the case, and there's no end in sight. And what do you do? Do you find a scapegoat? And China's a convenient scapegoat. The virus did originate in China. There are real problems with the way China handled it. Uh, Trump just you know, took it to the next level and ratcheted up the rhetoric. As U.S. President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping engage in bitter name-calling, the relations between the two countries take a dangerous downward spiral. China is more powerful than it was before. So when the U.S. and others push, the Chinese actually push back harder. Are the U.S. and Chinese relations edging to a point of no return, signaling the start of a new Cold War? It is a war in that it is increasingly a war of rhetoric. It is a contest between two ideologies. But is it the same as it was several decades ago? This is actually a crossover product. It is available throughout the year, season to season. Bernie Gross is the creative director of New York's designer sneaker store, Extra Butter, which curates a best-in-class assortment of products. Bernie has felt the impact of U.S. tariffs on Chinese-made products, which has affected wholesale goods and operational costs. Bernie has seen an uptick of prices on some of the more popular trainers to store Seoul, those imported from China. I think last summer when the topic of the, the trade war and the tariffs from Chinese imports kind of started hitting our market, there was maybe a little more anxiety, this kind of anticipation of like doom and gloom. I think we had already started talking with our sales reps from the brands and anticipating an increase of maybe five to $10 on the wholesale um, price of landed goods, which would reflect upwards of a $30 hike in product. Then the pandemic struck, which meant a complete stop in supplies from companies like Nike and Adidas as imports slowed to a halt. The store had to turn to US factories for supplies. This increased the cost of end products compared to cheaper prices offered by Chinese manufacturers. The store's own private label has now switched completely to manufacturers within the US, despite the higher costs it entails. I think moving forward, um, Extra Butter will likely uh, make their decisions more based on those, those social factors rather than the economic factors. We don't necessarily mind investing um, in higher cost if it means that it's something that's important to the brand, our staff, and our consumers. It's a sentiment mirrored by a few companies in the U.S., especially those in high-end retail. But not all businesses depending on China supplies have the luxury of making the switch as it will increase product prices and hurt American consumers. They are caught in the middle of the growing US-China tensions, now escalating with Trump's allegations that China did not do enough to stop the pandemic from spreading. We're not happy about China, I will tell you that. Uh, the ink wasn't dry on a great trade deal, and all of a sudden, the plague comes in from China. We're not happy about it. The pandemic has gotten out of hand in the United States. The U.S. is leading the world in terms of the number of, of cases of infection. 
two or three months ago, President Trump was saying that the virus was not serious. He would go away in a few matter, a matter of a few days. That hasn't been the case. And there's no end in sight in terms of the damage to the economy, to jobs. And what do you do? Do you blame yourself for not taking it seriously? Or do you find a scapegoat? And China's a convenient scapegoat. Back in January 2020, Trump was buoyant about the U.S.-China relations after signing the Phase One trade deal. It was believed to be the beginning of an end of a prolonged trade war. In February, following the coronavirus outbreak, Trump appreciated Xi for a very professional job in containing the spread. But when COVID-19 hit the U.S. and New York became the pandemic's new epicenter, the mood changed from one of euphoria to one of rage, and a war of words began. You've got the original tensions between the U.S. and China because of American concerns about China's economic model and the lack of reciprocity in the relationship, and then a deal that really didn't deliver. And then you've got uh, the pandemic, and from Washington's perspective, uh, China hid the information. And then you've got an election campaign uh, in which the president needs to look tough. This current sentiment is shared in both the Congress and the executive branch of government, and it's shared by both Democrats and Republicans. It's one of the true unifying issues in the United States political culture right now. So this is not just election antics. This is about Trump's frustration and the administration's frustration and Congress's frustration with China and the way China is treating international norms, inter the international rules-based order, international law itself. It has been nearly two years since the geopolitical spat began. In July 2018, two main factors led to the trade war. The United States' perception that trade between the U.S. and China is unequal and that China has been participating in unfair intellectual property practices. But to be fair, Trump has been a long-time critic of China. Well, if you go back decades, he's always cited China as a problem. He has the fixation on trade deficits. And China accounts for 50, 60 percent of the totality of America's trade deficits. Economists basically say that America has what we call the exorbitant privilege of running deficits with everybody else. Americans have been getting more goods than they've been producing, and they've been consuming beyond their income levels. So strictly speaking, from a technical aspect, it's not like China's taking advantage of America, but America is actually taking advantage of China. I think it's important to look back at the trajectory of the U.S.-China relationship over the course of the Trump administration, the lack of reciprocity since long before he was president. So, so I think Trump's tried very hard to reach an agreement with China, and he was unsuccessful. So, so Trump has been very frustrated with China, and you're seeing that expressed in numerous ways. And, and once the economic relationship proved to be essentially unrepairable, that's when we've seen the deterioration of other aspects of the relationship. So Trump's changing attitude is really reflect the momentum that's been created by the U.S. response to China's aggressiveness. Experts believe that there is bipartisan agreement amongst U.S. lawmakers and increasingly globally that their long-standing China policy has failed in getting Beijing to make any major course correction. It raises the question of how long the confrontational policy of the U.S. is likely to continue. There is little doubt that, that U.S.-China tensions um, of some sort will continue. It, this is sort of the, the long-term uh, you know, major geopolitical battle that we're going to be dealing with uh, for the foreseeable future. It's just that the, the, the specific implementation of it will differ. 
Perceptions in Washington DC and, and also other capitals worldwide have certainly shifted in recent years, largely due to the behavior of the Chinese regime uh, and the Xi, uh, the Xi administration uh, acting in ways that you know, are seen to be destabilizing, uh, if not challenging, the whole international order and US primacy uh, in the region. So no matter what happens in the elections in November in the United States, very likely uh, the, the next administration in the White House would continue uh, many of the policies uh, that we have seen under, under President Trump. The Trump administration has further targeted China over the wide-ranging Hong Kong security law, which gives Beijing extensive powers over the city. President Trump recently signed the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, ending the city's preferential trade status. So who suffers from this? Basically not China, it's basically Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong, the firms in Hong Kong. And who are these firms? And the dominant number, the dominant nationality of those firms are U.S. companies, U.S. banks. In June this year, China passed a wide-ranging new security law for Hong Kong, which gives Beijing sweeping authority to curtail the city's democratic freedoms. The law gives Beijing broad powers to crack down on what it deems political crimes, including separatism and collusion. It was condemned by U.S. lawmakers. Today, China is increasingly authoritarian at home and more aggressive in its hostility to freedom everywhere else. And President Trump has said, enough. I think, unfortunately, one country, two systems uh, for Hong Kong is over. We're now back to one country, one system. And uh, we're never going to return to the way it was uh, before. Uh, that's a real shame. Uh, the primary cause for that is Beijing's anxiety about the direction of Hong Kong and their discomfort with allowing true autonomy in the city and wanting to get that under control. I think the U.S. probably has acted too precipitously with the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, but it's totally appropriate for the United States to uh, align its policies towards the city with reality. In July, President Trump signed an executive order ending Hong Kong's preferential trade treatment. He also enacted a bill that would require sanctions against foreign individuals and banks for contributing to the erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy. This could open up Hong Kong to the tariffs the Trump administration has slapped on Chinese exports over the course of the prolonged trade war. America can no longer ignore the fundamental political and ideological differences between our countries, just as the CCP has never ignored them. First of all, you have to recognize that Hong Kong is part of China. It's not a separate legal entity in some sense, another country. It has been returned to China. And the issue is, does the central government have the right to basically deal with national security? And the central government is saying yes, but others would say no, you need the support of the Hong Kong people in some way. So there's a problem. China made a commitment in 1984 that they're now breaking. They need to understand that the U.S. and others aren't going to accept that. Now, going forward, what should the U.S. and others do? Does this mean totally break relations with China just because of these difficult things? I don't think that would make sense either. So we're still going to need to defend Western values, but at the same time, look for a way to do that uh, without uh, just simply uh, drawing a big line down the Pacific. It's not intervention. It's really dissuasion. The effort is to get China to recognize that its actions have consequences. And, and maybe China is not deterrable. Maybe China will continue to behave this way. But then it needs to understand that there's consequences for doing that. And there's consequences not just for the international system, which is going to lose benefits, but China as well. And that's what I think the spirit in which the Hong Kong Autonomy Act uh, should be seen. 
Hello, 大家好，我系李志景啊嘛。二零 Dominic Lee is the chairman of the Young Liberal Party, the youth wing of a moderate pro-establishment party in Hong Kong that runs on a conservative platform. He's also a serial entrepreneur who has founded and sold two businesses prior to starting his current venture in the electrical components industry. I'm Chinese. Hong Kong is a part of China, so I am first and foremost a Chinese who is living in Hong Kong right now, who is born and raised here, and uh, enjoying all the um, all the prosperity that Hong Kong has to offer. As a young politician who has studied in American universities, Dominic feels that the Trump administration is finding new excuses to get tough on China. For him, the Hong Kong security law is set. To change the city for the better. I think you cannot look at what U.S. has done recently、uh, in terms of just the national security law. I think the background has been、uh, like that for the past few years, where the, the United States is very worried of being surpassed by China as the、uh, strongest superpower in the world, and that has always been the background. If it weren't for the national security law, it would be. Something else, right? They're just using this as one of the excuses、um, to pose sanctions to China and to、uh, win the support of、uh, local Americans, where they believe that Trump is the guy that they can look up to to play hot balls on China. When you issue these sanctions, who's going to bear the cost of these sanctions? Well, the, the significant issue is not these few Chinese officials who will not be able to travel to America. Or whose bank accounts, if they have bank accounts in the U.S., will be frozen, because Chinese、uh, nationals, particularly government officials, in theory, shouldn't be having bank accounts outside China. So that's not not really an issue. The issue is the status, the special status that Hong Kong had, in terms of getting preferential access to the U.S. market, and they no longer will have that. So who suffers from this? Basically, not China. It's basically Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong. The firms in Hong Kong, and who are these firms? And the dominant number, a dominant nationality of those firms are U.S. companies, U.S. banks. Simon Shu is the founding chairperson of the Hong Kong Small and Medium Enterprises Association. He used to be in the manufacturing industry before moving to the tech sector. Currently, he's devoting time to running the association and helping SMEs secure loans. 最近咧呢個誒中美關係啦，同埋呢個疫情啦，就基本上就捆綁埋一齊嘅，咁亦都好難分。咁誒喺呢個疫情咧，誒早半年前咧就嗰個中國大陸啲工廠啦就停啊，我哋中國大陸都係以呢個出口生意為主嘅，咁啊嚴重影響我哋嘅出口生意嘅。咁當然我哋有多少內部嘅中國大陸內部市場嘅生意補充翻啦，但係實際上出口生意就影響得好大嘅，少咗三十個 percent 啦。With the U.S.-China tensions escalating, the U.S. is now targeting Hong Kong. As a result, businesses in Hong Kong have taken a huge beating. They only manage to get short-term orders as most companies gear up to combat the risk of an uncertain economic scenario. 美國政府咧而家的而且確即係利用不同嘅不同嘅方法啦，不同嘅嘢咧嚟制裁我哋香港啦，制裁我哋中國大陸啦。我哋香港一啲老闆咧就啲工廠咧都喺大陸啦，咁啊生產啲嘢啦，咁啊又有制裁啦，咁啊又稅務啦。都有影響嘅，咁啊其實都對我哋嘅生意啊，誒、呃、有即係好大嘅陰影啊影響。好多產品的而且確咧就要搬啦，有啲搬翻嚟香，早輪有啲搬翻嚟香港啦，而家有啲搬去台灣，有啲搬去越南啊、柬埔寨啦咁樣，咁啊事實上咧就有影響嘅，有影響啊對於啲。俾我哋香港都有影響。而家香港同埋大陸係同一個城市啦，同一個 level 啦，誒，同一個冇特惠優惠啦，咁樣冇嗰個政策優惠啦，咁所以香港都係香港嘅影響都好深遠嘅，將來都好麻煩嘅。咁我擔心都係將來都係喺短期內幾年都係唔係好好嘅。
the manufacturing centers is in mainland China. So when you basically get rid of these preferences and you put these tariffs now on Hong Kong products, it turns out it hits 1%. 1% of the exports of Hong Kong products, because it's only 1% it's actually made in the, in, in the mainland. The rest basically are not, doesn't have anything to do with Hong Kong. So in all essence, you really don't hit China. You hit basically the people of Hong Kong and you end up hitting American companies and that doesn't make any sense. American companies and executives in Hong Kong are worried about the city's future. A recent survey conducted by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong said that businesses were considering moving capital, assets or business operations to other locations after Beijing passed the Hong Kong security law and the US-China tensions worsened. It's not just businesses, but also residents who are choosing to move to other countries. I could not represent others, but uh, I would always say if someone, they try to, they chose to leave Hong Kong under the new national security law, I always respect their choice. If they think that they could utilize their influence outside Hong Kong to help the people of Hong Kong, I think that is certainly a respectful move. Just like Nathan Law, he fled Hong Kong to continue his international um, negotiation work uh, in the United, uh, in the United Kingdom. I think this is a very good example. But towards myself and also towards the generation that I belong to, many of us, we deem that Hong Kong is the only place that we could call home. When Hong Kong is facing a lot of challenges and facing stronger and stronger surveillance and control from China, we deem that we have a responsibility to stop that, to resist it. We will choose to continue to fight in Hong Kong, no matter how the national security law is imposed or how the situation on Hong Kong could be continue to be worsened. While youngsters like Fergus Leung want to continue to stay and fight for their rights, there are others who are choosing to settle elsewhere, like in neighbouring Taiwan. The Tsai Ing-wen administration has said that it will help Hong Kongers seeking to move to Taiwan. But a huge influx of Hong Kong residents may come at a risk of Taiwan confronting Beijing's anger. And I think the Taiwanese government uh, is aware that they need to be careful as well not to turn Taiwan into a, a remote base from which uh, Hong Kong activists are launching attacks on, on Hong Kong and, and China. Uh, the Tsai administration is aware that you do not want to create more incentives for Beijing uh, to retaliate against, against Taiwan. The U.S.-China relations are stuck in a vicious downward spiral. In a latest move, the Trump administration has ratcheted up its confrontation with Beijing, ordering the Chinese consulate in Houston to close over concerns of economic espionage. China retaliated by shutting down the U.S. consulate in Chengdu. This comes on the back of sparring over the pandemic and accusations of intellectual property theft and human rights violations. The two countries are also clashing over China's security crackdown in Hong Kong. The truth is that our policies and those of other free nations resurrected China's failing economy only to see Beijing bite the international hands that were feeding it. For a number of decades, the United States played a key role in you know, helping China build its economy, uh, integrate the international system, and that is a reason why China now has arrived at a near a great power status in the region. Uh, the key problem uh, that we are seeing now is that alongside China's emergence as a great power, we have seen the deepening of its autocratic way of means of governance. So the conflict that we're seeing right now is not so much fears of the emergence of China as a great power, uh, but much more the fact that it is emerging as a great power and at the same time being increasingly despotic, autocratic and a destabilizing force within the region and international relations. 
China now is much more illiberal domestically and it's much more assertive internationally in trying to rewrite the rules of the road in global institutions, uh, rewrite the rules of the road in its region with regard to the South China Sea and its relations with its neighbors, uh, change how we manage uh, information in the internet. And so I think if, if China embraced uh, a lot of the rules of the road that it uh, started to when it joined the WTO uh, and start, began to integrate, there would be less anxieties. But the bigger concerns are about Chinese intentions uh, under Xi Jinping. What type of world does Xi Jinping want and what is he doing to try and achieve it? Eagle is a 28-year-old graphic designer a former Hong Kong resident, she felt unsafe after witnessing a female medic injured by the police right in front of her. She decided to move to Taiwan with her father, following the 2019 protests against the Hong Kong extradition bill. I'm very scared, so I decided that I'm not in a safe place in Hong Kong, so I decided that I'm going to go to Taiwan. Then I moved to Taiwan. Hello, everyone. Eagle is a YouTube content creator and has a steady fan following. She shares with her audience about her life in Taiwan as an immigrant. For her viewers in Hong Kong and potential immigrants, she makes informational videos about things to consider before planning a move to Taiwan. Actually, As Beijing tightens its grip on the city and muzzles media freedoms, Taiwan is seeing an influx of people from Hong Kong seeking asylum here. For many, Taiwan is a choice destination due to its cultural and geographical proximity as well as its long-standing support for democracy. So Taiwan has regarded this as an opportunity to attract talented individuals uh, to help build up its, its own society as well. I would be very surprised if we saw a uh, very large influx of Hong Kong refugees uh, choosing Taiwan as a destination. And I think the Taiwanese government uh, is aware that they need to be careful as well not to turn Taiwan into a, a remote base from which uh, Hong Kong activists are launching attacks on, on Hong Kong and, and China. Uh, the Tsai administration is aware that you do not want to create more incentives for Beijing uh, to retaliate against, against Taiwan. The Tsai administration has to play a delicate balancing act, especially at a time when America's support to Taiwan is angering China. In March this year, President Trump signed into law an act that requires increased U.S. support for Taiwan internationally, prompting a denunciation by China. The Trump administration has ramped up backing for the island with arms sales and laws to help Taiwan deal with pressure from China. Poor little Taiwan is, is caught in the middle of these two uh, fighting elephants. It's an emerging clash of ideologies. It sends signals of displeasure by increasing its military pressure on Taiwan, its transits around Taiwan, uh, and, and in doing so challenges the regional order that is uh, siding with the United States in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there is a likelihood that Beijing could decide to escalate uh, by truly targeting Taiwan militarily or with the launch of a blockade, 
or if not seizing some of its outlying uh, islands or assets in, in the South China Sea, for example, which inevitably would have an impact on the balance of power in, in the region. So no matter what Taiwan does, uh, it will always get uh, sucked into that, that battle between, uh, between China and, and the United States. The issue is that um, the South China Sea uh, or the Nine Dash Line claimed by the People's Republic of China was actually inherited from the Eleven Dash Line claim by the Republic of China now in Taiwan. So both Taipei and Beijing share the similar, almost identical claim in the South China Sea. However, Taiwan is heavily uh, you know, rely on our bilateral relationship with the United States to make Taiwan secure and prosper. So for Taiwan, the best interest is to cross our fingers and, and hope that there won't be a um, irreversible military conflict in the South China Sea. On July 13th, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo outline the U.S. position on maritime claims in the South China Sea. The U.S. has deployed two aircraft carriers in the region, with a third carrier lurking nearby. It staged its largest exercise in the South China Sea in years, which China called muscle flexing, designed to militarize the region. China has its own drills in the region, with Chinese warships conducting live-fire missile practice. America can no longer ignore the fundamental political and ideological differences between our countries, just as the CCP has never ignored them. As a maritime power, we have very, very distinct interests and rights that are granted under international law that we're going to continue to seek to protect. China is challenging that, and they are characterizing U.S., European, Australian, Japanese efforts to protect those rights and interests as, as provocative, as militarization, or as increasing tensions. And that may be the case, and that's their perception, and they're entitled to it. But the reality is these are countries protecting their interests where they conflict with China. That's the heart of, of the new security paradigm in the region. If the free world doesn't change, doesn't change. Communist China will surely change us. What uh, Pompeo's statement uh, made clear is that now it is the official position of the United States that the China's maritime claims uh, in the South China Sea are illegal. Uh, and that harkens back to the international court decision in 2016, for example. Uh, now, so this sends a much clearer signal on the part of the United States government uh, that it is committed to international law uh, wh when it comes to uh, claims in the South China Sea. Uh, now for that to truly get Beijing's attention, you certainly need not only the rhetoric that is coming out of Washington DC, uh, but also a commitment in terms of military presence uh, and also assistance to other claimants in the region. For almost 100 years now, of course, we have a global uh, system largely created and nurtured by America and the West. There's a concern that China is trying to weaken the system to impose its own values. I think this is a legitimate concern. China wants to have a role in the world and says, I would like to have an influence in Asia more than I did in the past. You could not sail, for example, nuclear submarine or spy planes along the coast of the United States and the Atlantic, even beyond the 200 mile zone, you can't do that. That's because America would say, this is my sphere of influence. So what do you see from a China perspective here is, here are American warships, airplanes. They're not here in the United States. They're way over there near the Chinese and Asian borders patrolling everything. And China basically says, if I did that to you, you wouldn't tolerate it. Why should I accept you doing it to me? This is a problem. Amidst increasing tensions between two of the world's biggest economies, Washington is pressing for a decoupling from China, with a few other countries pulling up the drawbridges as well. But economic decoupling is easier said than done. 
Cutting ties altogether is probably impossible, but certainly diversifying trade and investment and manufacturing and whatnot uh, is a process that is accelerating now, uh, but has been happening for a number of years already. From trade war to COVID-19 crisis, from the battle for tech dominance to a clash over geopolitical hegemony, tensions have soared between two of the world's biggest economies. In April this year, when the pandemic burrowed itself into the US population, President Trump stated that this was the World Health Organization's fault as it was too partisan and did not represent global interests. In July, the Trump administration formally notified the UN of its intention to withdraw from and sever its relationship with the WHO and redirect funds to US health priorities. It doesn't make any sense. We have to recognize that the WHO is a global international agency. It isn't actually an entity of its own. The US, Europe, China, Japan, everybody has personnel and they contribute. U.S. CDC doctors and medical experts are in daily contact with WHO experts. So the information coming from WHO, a lot of it actually is being generated by American doctors. It's not being generated by a nebulous institution. It's generated by medical experts from all over the place, including China, including Europe, including the U.S. So to accuse the WHO, to ban WHO, is in some sense banning yourself. I think a number of world leaders would agree with the view that instead, uh, instead of pulling out, what you want to see is influential countries, influential democracies, deepening their commitment and engagement in those organizations. Simply pulling out creates a vacuum that countries like China, uh, who have deep pockets, uh, will be more than happy to fill, and by doing so, it gives them even more influence to transform and to lead and to direct these, these organizations. A thorn in the side of U.S.-China relations has been the two-year-long trade dispute that has put many businesses across the world in trouble. But some of them are trying to find new ways to keep their businesses afloat. We're going to find most of our garlic in the Central Valley, closer to the Fresno area. Ken Christopher of Christopher Ranch is the largest fresh garlic grower and shipper in the United States. The ranch grows 100 million pounds of garlic a year over their 6,000 acre farm. It's about 40% of all garlic consumed in America. Located in Gilroy, California, known as the garlic capital of the world, the ranch was founded by Ken's grandfather in 1956 and Ken has been on a mission to fight against Chinese garlic since the 1990s. Before 1993, almost all of the garlic consumed here in America was grown in America. But in 1993, almost overnight, tens of millions of pounds of Chinese garlic flooded the U.S. market, dramatically driving down the price of garlic nationwide. And what they were doing is um, they were illegally dumping the product and so it wasn't until last year when the Trump tariffs went into effect that we really started to get some action blocking all Chinese garlic from entering the country. The 25% increase in tariffs imposed on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods is nothing short of a godsend. It's ended the garlic farmers' 25-year battle with Chinese imports. And today, there's a 25% reduction in Chinese shipments. But then in March this year, COVID-19 struck America when restaurants shut down and the entire country started going to the grocery stores. The demand for garlic among consumers hit levels that no one could ever anticipate. For several months from April through to June, there was a nation and international garlic shortage that really drove up the price of garlic worldwide. Uh, fortunately, this June, we had one of our best crops that we've ever seen. As major states like Texas, Florida, Arizona start to turn off again, we're seeing another rush back to grocery stores, which means another rush back to fresh garlic. 
But what's good for garlic growers in the US is not so for the soybean, dairy and pig farmers who have seen their businesses dry up. The trade war and the global pandemic have been pushing many countries to reconfigure supply chains. With Trump hinting at decoupling the US economy from China, there's no end in sight to the continuing impasse. Does this mean the death of globalization? Total decoupling is impossible after decades of globalization. Um, but separation of key industries and the manufacturers um, that related to national survival uh, and national health and uh, critical competitiveness would probably go for uh, decoupling. For decoupling to happen, you will, you will need to see the emergence of similar infrastructure in other parts of the world, uh, which simply do not exist right now. They do not exist across Southeast Asia. Uh, they certainly do not exist across India right now. Uh, so the ability to decouple or to diversify uh, will be contingent on other countries, on those alternatives, uh, being willing to invest uh, and to create these infrastructures that permit the export of materials uh, into uh, the international system. The decoupling rhetoric has been followed by retaliatory acts from both sides. Closure of consulates, sanctions on senior officials and politicians, and expulsion of journalists. The relations have gone further south, with the US banning Huawei and pressuring other countries to do so. Every government who has to make a decision about uh, Huawei has a difficult choice here. In terms of cost and getting this 5G technology to their consumers, to their population, it makes sense to go with Huawei. Uh, but in terms of uh, security and privacy and working with the United States, there are risks to doing so. It is a real concern that Huawei is influenced by the Chinese government and could, in theory, although we don't have evidence they've done that so far, but could, in theory, use that to, to gather data and, and spy on the citizens of those countries. So the issue of security has to do with the use of equipment, not the equipment itself. There are ways of dealing with that. You can regulate it. I think the reality in this world, in terms of global power relations, is that large countries bully small countries. And I think it's, it's reasonable for people to say that China's become more assertive, that it uh, is pretty aggressive in promoting its views. The same is true uh, for the United States. Britain gave up on Huawei because America exerted pressure, not because it's a decision come, it came on its own. This pressure is being felt in Asia and other, other countries. Canada is now under pressure. To, to not adopt Huawei systems. Australia basically said it won't use it. And that's because America exerts its influence. Experts like Yukon Huang question if the US can try to accommodate China's aspirations within the current system of international rules and norms. Are we embarking on a new Cold War? Back then, before the fall of the former Soviet Union, the Cold War was between what I call two alliances. The former Soviet Union was not just Russia, but also the Central Asian Republics, Ukraine, Latvia, Baltics, Poland, Romania, a whole block of the Eastern European economies was once high hand. And what I would call the Western alliances, Europe and America, representing markets, capitalism, democracies. And you had this kind of tension between these two blocks. That's one thing that's different. Today, it's not blocks is largely between America and China. The term Cold War, if we use it in the lower case, means that there are hostilities, there is a contest, there is a challenge, uh, but the cold meaning that it has yet, and hopefully never will, uh, turn to a hot war whereby we are seeing direct clashes between, between militaries. Competition, in my mind, is a much better term. Um, but it's less satisfying if you see U.S.-China conflict as the defining characteristic of power dynamics, uh, not just in the region, but around the world today. The Cold War was really defined by a containment strategy that pitted the U.S., Europe, Japan, South Korea, other allies against the Soviet Union. And those countries were economically isolated from the Soviet Union 
and its allies, the, the Warsaw Pact. So you basically had a bipolar dyad. These two blocs did not have what I call extensive economic relations. They didn't really trade with each other. They really didn't invest much with each other. But that's not the case with China. China is the world's largest trading nations. Its major customers are in the West. The financial flows going both ways are largely between the West and China. Labor flows, knowledge flows, financial flows, enormous between China and America and Europe. So in that sense, it's very hard to have a, what I call a serious Cold War when the two participants are economically so intertwined. There's no clear-cut end to the U.S.-China standoff, just like there was in the case of the Cold War between the U.S. and the former Soviet Union. The relations between two of the world's largest economies can remain tense for the foreseeable future. While trade binds the countries together, strategic rivalry and political hostility persist. Are the U.S.-China relations edging to a point of no return? We're not seeing proxy wars. We're not even seeing arms races, particularly. China's been building up its military rapidly, um, making dramatic investments in its military modernization. But that's not necessarily to challenge the U.S. globally. You know, that's to achieve very specific goals on its periphery in uh, Northeast and Southeast Asia. So it's really more a case of competition. Whether this devolves into a more full-scale Cold War, where we are actually uh, really trying to undercut each other around the globe and in international institutions and vie for allies uh, and competitors, uh, still remains to be seen. The election in November in Washington will make a difference in how the U.S. thinks about China and acts. Uh, and you could see some modifications of policies that help achieve some more stability in the relationship without the day-to-day -day, uh, tumult that we currently have. But it still will come down to whether China is willing to accommodate some of these genuine and reasonable concerns that Washington and others have. We have entered an era where I think we need a term to characterize the current status of these two camps, and it certainly is a contest, it certainly is a clash, uh, and it, that needs to be acknowledged. I think we have reached a point where we are seeing that confrontation becoming uh, increasingly uh, real. It is a part of our lives, uh, and more and more it affects people uh, all over the world. We are seeing lines being drawn in the sand and lines being drawn at sea. Uh, and with that, certainly, uh, there is inherently a growing possibility that at some point that could lead uh, to military clashes.